Well, Liesl, so I am actually, this is an odd way to start off, but I'm the father of four daughters and (laughs) 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 we, we've, we've watched you uh, on the screen, on the big screen. So I, uh, you know, generally people that have listened to more than profit before would have, would have known like, okay, we start with generally, you know, early years, kind of what's informed and influenced you. Uh, And so we can Google you and there's, there's just (laughs) a lot out there. Um, so we don't need to go that direction. I really would be curious from your perspective, you know, there's everything that everybody talks about Liesl and kind of your background. What, what though are you most, um, thankful for in your early years of life? What, what kind of, uh, do you look back on and, you know, wish people actually knew more about, uh, from the early years of, of, of growing up and, you know, maybe even informed and influenced the things that you're, you're focused on today. (laughs) Um, Yeah, well, that's, uh, yes, having four daughters, I'm sure you've watched more of A Little Princess than you you care to. Um, Oh, it's great. It's great. (laughs) On repeat. (laughs) I know. it's. I have two daughters, um, but they're a little bit little yet. They haven't seen it yet. Um, Okay. But I know I'm like, I I can't wait. Um, But, you know, it's interesting because, yes, I spent the first kind of the first half of my life, really from seven until about 20, um, as an actor. And I mean, I did some film, um, but I mostly did a whole lot of theater. Um, and I was quite busy with that, um, which I think is good when you're young and it kind of keeps you out of trouble when you have to be at the theater, you know, every night between, (laughs) between seven and 11, um, keeps you out of trouble. Um, but actually, it's it's really interesting. I'm I I feel like having a theater background and an acting background has actually um, there's a there's some interesting skill sets that I have found have served me as an investor, um, mostly around reading power dynamics in rooms. Um, mm-hmm. uh, you know who has the power, who wants it. I mean that's mostly what what you're doing in in rehearsal. Um, in theater is is breaking down power dynamics um, and uh, and then the tension that ensues around it, which is essentially a board meeting, right? Um, yeah. <laughs> so um, I've actually found that there's it's 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 not a terrible background to have. Um, also, um, you have a, a extremely uh, patient view of failure and rejection. So, when you are getting rejected many times a week <laughs> to your face in auditions, um, the idea of a startup going under, like, eh, it's okay, it happens. Mm-hmm. Investments go south, they go north, things work out, they don't. Um, nothing necessarily needs to define your career. So I think some things like that have served me um, as I've you know, made the natural transition from <laughs> actor to impact investor. <laughs> but you know, I... I think the the power dynamics piece is is brilliant. Um, I, I think uh, a lot of times the conversations I've had with 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 asset holders or fund managers, um, they actually forget oftentimes um, the humanity uh, of the person or the company. They they look at the numbers, right? And the numbers don't lie is kind of the old adage, right? The numbers don't lie. And I think the, you, you, when you kind of get them to snap back in and say, oh, wait a minute, that's a person across the table or, you know, this is someone who's vulnerable. You know, you talk about rejection, like many, many founders and you guys do direct deals as well. Then when they come in, they're not just bringing you something they want you. They're bringing you their baby. They're bringing you something. And it's it's like, hey, what do you think about this? Um, and with the minute you open your mouth as an investor and you say something uh, that it means more than just like a yes or a no or a maybe. There's a lot going in, into that. Um, so I actually love the story that you have of, of childhood actress to uh, impact <laughs> investor, because I, I hope that more people that are in this space, working with asset holders, holding fund managers accountable, recognize the power that they have and how to use that power more wisely. So w- what does that look like for you? At, you know, Right now, obviously, Blue Haven and many other initiatives, but what does that look like as you are working with, whether it's a a company to invest in, a, a nonprofit initiative that you're working on, or a fund manager you're giving consideration for. How does that go into your thinking uh, at, at Blue Haven? Well, so so now you know what we've built up. So Blue Haven will turn ten officially 
um, as the family office next year. I know we had, we were like, oh my God. Um, uh, since we sort of formalized the family office with this kind of all in strategy and what we have tried to do over the years. I mean, I think, look, I think it's similar, um, similar with, with, with an audition, right? If it's not the right fit, you know, it immediately. And the real, and the, and the humane thing to do is to say, sounds great. Nothing personal. It's not a great fit for us. And so I think that's one thing that I've really learned is, um, you know, if it's, if it is not, or is not a good fit, say no quickly and don't waste, um, an entrepreneur, an entrepreneur or a fund manager's time. So, I mean, that's yeah. one thing we've, re- we've, we've, I hope gotten better at. I think I really sucked at that early mm-hmm. on because I was also, I wanted to learn what, you know, hear more about the fund, hear more. And I, I, I didn't quite know what my own investment thesis was early on. So I was a whole lot slower um, to say no early on. So I think that's one thing that we've hopefully really changed um, to try to respect people's time. And yeah, you know, you put your blood, sweat and tears into every pitch you make. Um, you know, you don't want to be to be let on by a potential sure. investor. That's not very nice. Um, but I think also um, what we, yeah, we've tried to be quick, um, but also very honest of, you know, this is something that's interesting. It is a little too early for us. Come back to us in six, you know, we've, we've, we don't really try to play hide the ball. Um, uh, or if we have other investors, we try to be helpful with other introductions as well. I mean, I think fairly typical, hopefully best practices amongst other investors Um, but, uh, I do think that, uh, and then making sure with investor, with, with investments that we have made, whether it's companies or fund managers, um, really trying to elevate them and highlight these excellent fund managers and companies and what they're doing. And, um, whether it's on our own social media or hosting events with other investors for them, um, but we try to amplify um, the investments that we do make in any way that we can. Um, so I think those are some of the things. That's great. Um, on the on the sort of power dynamic front, I mean another another big piece as well because we do understand that we do have a lot of power as asset owners. Um, a, a big thing that we've been supportive of over on kind of our civic engagement side, which is more on the philanthropy is around, you know, appropriate taxes for people like us, um, like a wealth tax or um, other ways that actually we as asset owners can be accountable to our own communities. And so um, uh, that's something else that we take very seriously, not so much on the investment side, but, um, well, they, 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 they're, they're not ex- mutually exclusive, right? They, you know, you're recognizing as an asset owner, okay, I have a responsibility to this company or this, this fund manager to be, to be honest, to be upfront, but then also like, okay, I'm an asset owner. So I have a responsibility to my community. And so I should be taxed appropriately and, and support the efforts that, that really help uh, the community at large. So I think yeah. those are, those are two great ends of the spectrum, I think, coming together. Uh, which is what I love about kind of your strategy at Blue Haven. Uh, and we'll get into that in a little bit. But um, I like this idea of, we, we, we kind of say the same thing around the power dynamics of like a quick no is is oftentimes just as good as a yes. Be, and often, and it's kind of counterintuitive because a lot of times companies or fund managers, you know, we think, we think we're doing them a service by, you know, telling them the things that we think they want to hear, which is like, oh, this is awesome. Like, come yeah. back, let's talk some more. And the reality is it's like, we're just stringing them along and they're busy. Their time is precious, just as precious as ours. And we owe them, uh, the respect and the, and the, um, to, to tell them like, Hey, you know, a great idea just doesn't fit. And, you know, maybe I can make an introduction if it makes sense, but uh, I'm sorry, or come back to us. We love it. It's just too soon. Um, I love that, 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 you know, getting to that kind of honest, quick conversation is super helpful to the other party. And really, I think is endearing. I'm sure you found as well. Well, and, and, and also we do a lot of analysis also, um, particularly on our direct investing side of the, um, of the, uh, the ventures that we say no to and kind of what, what was the reason? Was it because it was just totally outside of our geography or our scope of work? Um, 
Was it because the founder um, misspelled something in a deck? Was it because um, they, uh, you know, we we um, we genuinely don't think they have a very big market, or like what were the things? Because I think one of the things that sometimes we talk a lot about in impact investing is, you know, supporting emerging managers or you know, looking for unique kinds of track record or experience to bring to something that isn't necessarily a sort of Silicon Valley tech bro. Um, but then when we're faced with it in our inbox, we kind of revert back mm. to what we say we're not going to do. And, um, you know, we've found that ourselves when we're, you know, just, you know, within Blue Haven and we're like, oh, wow, look at all the look at all the women that we mm. didn't <laughs> invest yeah. in because we said they were too early or they weren't being ag um, aggressive enough in their projections or things like that. And so when that's changed um, our investing style as well, um, because I do think that sometimes perceived risk is not really, is, is, is not there, um, but yeah. we have to keep reminding ourselves because there's a lot of rhetoric around it. And particularly now around, you know, women and people of color, um, and how egregiously underinvested they are, well, then we actually need to like actually then move money yeah, <laughs> into sure. those places if we want to take advantage of what I think um, is an amazing economic opportunity that we're all overlooking. Yeah. Well, we'll get back to the investment side. I think what one thing that right now would be great to, to rewind the clock a little bit because you said Blue Haven's 10 years old. And what I think was really impressive was from the from the formation of Blue Haven, you and your husband basically determined and declared that we're going to make this uh, an aligned strategy with our values. Um, there's a lot of great quotes out there about that we have a moral obligation to to know where this this capital is going. And at the end of the day, that is impact investing. That we it's a moral imperative. And so whether that's giving or whether that's investing. Uh, we need to we need to be doing this. And so help me understand, how did you even get to that? Like what influenced Blue Haven from the earliest days to to even go that direction? Yeah, I mean, so I think a, a large part of this as well is a little bit of, um, you know, I have an inheritor's mindset. I, I, I come from a business family. Um, I inherited control over my assets when I was 21. And, you know, that's not money I made. I made a little bit from a little princess, not nearly this much. Does not pay as well as hospitality acting, turns out. Um, <laughs> well, especially over the many decades, right? I'm just... <laughs> no, exactly. And theater, absolutely not. Um, and so, <laughs> um, anyway, uh, but joking aside, so I, yeah. um, I inherited control over my assets when I was 21. And I am very well aware of the fact that those aren't assets that I earned. I got born lucky. Um, they were passed on to me and um, I'm going to pass them on to future generations. Again, I think I should be taxed a hell of a lot more than I am now, but I'm still planning on, on stewarding those assets to the next generation. So now for the brief period of time that they're in my hands, I'm accountable to, I'm responsible for them. Um, I'm responsible for what they're doing in the world. Um, whether or not I wanna talk about it or not, they're doing things. All of those investments are doing something. And so I wanna know what that is. Um, and the more you learn about what your assets are doing or could be doing, I think the more you lean into um, the kind of the impact side of things. And honestly, it's just more fun and interesting. <laughs> um, it really is. That's where it the is. fun stuff is. <laughs> and so, um, it really is. And so that's, that was, um, it's, it's, that's kind of the, 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 the kind of the, the moral imperative piece of it. Um, and that also drove the decision to use all of our assets because I don't understand how you can hold that point of view and just say, oh, but only with this, mm. you know, like my, my assets only have an impact, but just this 30% of them, like that doesn't make, that does not hold water as a concept. Um, uh, and so that really kind of then when Ian and I kind of sat down, we were like, all right, well, we, we, we definitely need to pay attention to what our assets are doing. 
which means we want them to be have a positive impact, um, and we have to do it with everything, um, and we want to do it in a in a diversified and a you know a prudent manner. Sure. Um, and we we are pretty sure that there are going to be enough great opportunities out there that we can actually do this. Um, and that was kind of the premise from where from where we started. Um, the other thing that has morphed along the way um, that we didn't necessarily we, we we've sort of discovered as we go, which I think sort of sounds obvious now, um, but we've really started to pay attention to what we cannot address or should not address in our investment portfolio. So you know, not everything is a market-based solution that can scale beautifully. Um, some things are, some things are awesome and markets and investments and VC and, you know, bond issuances and things like that. The market mechanisms are fabulous for scaling. I think energy has, clean tech has a ton of great examples yeah. in that space, financial services, um, different insurance products, things like that, um, where markets, and business is a great driver of scale. And then there are other things, other areas that I think are super important um, that markets and businesses either shouldn't touch or have do a terrible job when they do. Um, and those are things that I think, you know, our, yep. our tax dollars should go towards things that, I mean, look, I'm a, I'm a theater girl. Theater is not sustainable, but it is wildly important um, and people love it. it. But it is not, you cannot pay for a show just through ticket sales for the vast, unless you're Hamilton. Right. Um, and so the thing is, is that that doesn't mean that it's not super valuable. It means that um, a venture backed theater company is a terrible idea. Yeah. Um, and so that's one thing that we've really tried to do as well is, is say, is this is this an investable? Should should our investment portfolio be touching this issue at all? Mm. Um, and if so, is this the right way to do it? And if not, does this move over to our philanthropy? Does it move over to our policy work? Like, what's the appropriate sort of sort of yeah. lens through which to view that solution? So that's been that's often been a source of a lot of no's lately. Is like it's just this isn't. Marcus shouldn't touch this. And I love, so everything you are articulating, I'm like, yes, preach on, preach on. This is great. <laughs> because because uh, the things that I was writing, as I was taking notes as you were talking, but like the first thing that, I, that really resonated with me and I think that I hope resonates with our listeners is the reality that this is fun. Like where, where your heart is as a person, right? Your values, what drives you, what you're passionate about it's going to activate you. Like you're going to be inspired. You're going it, to, it's, it, it happens to everybody, you know? And so I think when we think about aligning our values with our investments or our strategies around community development or whatever that may be, it's going to activate those passions. And so it's fun. It's not a, you know, it's not a financial model that gets most people excited. Some people like my chief investment officer <laughs> gets them <laughs> excited, but that's why, you know, there's different people for different things. Right. Yeah. But I think what I love is like, yes, this is fun. It doesn't make it, it doesn't seem it mean it's easy. So the second thing I wrote down, which I think is awesome is there have to be opportunities out there for this. And also what I'm picking up on too, is if there aren't opportunities, how can we help maybe create some of those opportunities? And I've seen you do that through different initiatives that you've been a part of, whether it's Global Impact Investment Network or the Impact, um, recognizing the gaps that exist and saying, okay, what can we do to help build the market, build the field, close these gaps, create more opportunities for fund managers? So we've got to have that foresight and I think that, that, that vision for the future. And then I love this idea that not everything is a market solution. Because I think oftentimes what people hear is like, it's got to be, if it's not scalable, i.e. venture backable, yeah. it's not cool or impressive. And I, and I, it's funny when I talk to people about like, the only 1% of companies ever take venture. So yeah. we've got to get creative with how we deploy capital. And we've got to give people a vision that like, just because you're not taking venture doesn't mean it's not an impactful or an impressive or a worthwhile endeavor. Like... We owe it to the world, our communities, and these people 
to create solutions that help get them to what they need. So <laughs> I love it. It's great. I, I, I agree. I think, I think that the, how few companies and how few, you know, businesses and capital markets actually are venture sort of venture backed or make sense to be venture backed versus the noise. Good God. <laughs> they're a very loud community. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and, and, um, they are. Oh, well, and, I, yeah. and I think what I love is, um, People make intentional decisions. Like I, I, I honestly think I, I try to tell some people don't go venture. Like what do you like? I, I really try to start with what are you trying to do in the world? What do you care most about? Don't don't buy into that noise because, you know, because a lot of times even founders that have potentially scalable solutions, their passion, their baby is that solution, and they don't recognize the minute they give away equity ownership. There's got to be some some form of exit for those investors. Yeah, and an exit oftentimes means. They're not doing what they're doing. And so it's like, okay, how can we reorient this? Like, how can we take our cues off of companies like New Belgium or Buffer or some of these really cool companies that are doing it differently because their passion is actually the people that are working on this product more than well, five and, to seven years out? <laughs> and what do you think? You know, we've, we've, we've done a, like a touch of this and we're looking at more of kind of the, the sort of revenue-based financing uh -huh. and things like that. Is that something like I'm starting to see more of that? happening, oh, yeah. which I think is really exciting. It is it, extremely. We actually have a couple of uh, those funds in our in our portfolio. So we just invested in Colab Capital out of uh, uh, Atlanta okay. and cool. just super impressed with their strategy. Uh, and we had Jewel on, on a previous podcast um, just talking about the model that they have around supporting founders of color, recognizing that it doesn't need to just be venture, um, looking at a profit sharing model. But I love it. I mean, I, I love it because these are companies that are creating jobs in a place like Louisville, where we are, a lot of them aren't venture backable um, yeah. because they, they've, um, and one, honestly, venture may not be the best solution for a Louisville because if they're going to scale to that point, they've got to go to Boston. They've got to go to New York or they've got to go to San Francisco. That's just where the capital is and, and different things. And so like, if we're really trying to create economic vitality in mid America and these flyover States, if you will, we've got to come up with different solutions. Um, and so from a fund manager, that's why I love like community investment management, what Jacob Har and, and my co have been building uh, and supporting some of those kind of channel partners that are deploying capital differently. So I, I love it. I think yeah. we need more of it because I think it still is a, such a, an early nascent field and still a lot of investors don't understand the impacts on the term sheets and cert, you know service providers are uncertain of it. So there's a lot of education that really needs to happen there too. Yeah. No, I think, I think that would be great. Yeah. That's, we're still trying to wrap our heads. It's like, there's some, you know, I don't know. There was one thing I was looking at and like, our, our, we got, we got scared about a tax situation. We couldn't kind of wrap mm -hmm. our heads around how it would get from a tax perspective. So I'm eagerly it's, watching. Um, yeah, it, it is tough. To so let's, that. let's share notes on that. Cause that's, a, right. that's an important thing, which kind of leads me to the next thing. Cause I'm sure you have a similar, uh, you know, you're 100% mission aligned. You, you've been that since day one. But there's got to be, it's got to be a journey, I'm sure. And we, we always say like, even though we're mission aligned in our deployment as well, we're always looking at ways, how can we get better? Oh, how yeah. Can we, so what are some lessons you've learned and how are, what are you currently focused on in, in really improving uh, the work of Blue Haven towards not just like 100% mission alignment, but like really more deeply and intentionally constructing your portfolio um, around what you care, care most about? So I think, I mean, it's definitely, it's taken many, many years and, mm -hmm. um, and a lot of help to sort of start to, to fill out the portfolio. Um, I think one of the things that, um, that we've done is, I mean, we, we tried to keep a fairly, um, uh, kind of a fairly broad universe of what we kind of consider impact. And what we were really looking for is, you know, the, the, if we're looking at a certain fund, like the, the first lens that we consider it through is it's, you know, sort of financial profile. So how liquid is it? How long's the lockup? Like, you know, what's the risk return profile for what it is? And is it, does that fit into our asset allocation? And sure. then within that, you know, if we're, let's say we're looking for a VC fund to fill out our allocation for the year, um, 
we'll get a little bit narrow around like, okay, we're looking at, um, you know, U.S. health tech. Um, but then we really want to see, we really want to meet the managers and hear what their strategies are instead of saying it's got to be diabetes prevention or it's mm -hmm. got to be, you know, um, uh, COVID related or it's got to be it, th at that point. Um, if we, we want to get narrow enough that we are getting exposure to the sector that strategically we want to, and then it's all about the pieces of the manager. Right. Um, and is that someone that we want to get on board with for 10 years? Um, <laughs> and, yeah. I mean, and that's, yeah. that's great to, I think there's two things that I, I really resonated with. One, we have to put, what are the financial expectations that has to be on the table. I mean, I think we can't ignore that. Like looking at our assets and saying, okay, where does this fit in the landscape? What are we hoping to accomplish? It, it needs to be part of the filter and the lens. But then, like you said earlier, you know, there have to be opportunities within that scope, within that framework to align the, the, our mission and values with the, this financial outlook. So I love that where it's like not putting that aside, not saying, okay, let's go after some sort of health tech venture fund. And then I hope, I hope it's going to get some sort of financial performance that fits our, but to say, no, no, like, what are we trying to do with this capital? Yeah. I, and, and, you know, and to be honest about, um, you know, okay. Yes. A lot of the, you know, direct investments and interesting, um, uh, some of the interesting funds are less liquid, but I, I have to have liquidity, <laughs> you know, like we need to, you know, we have to be realistic about how we're, you know, paying the bills, funding our philanthropy, paying our, you know, like sure. we can't kind of get ourselves into a trap. Um, and so I, I think, I think that's, that's a big part of it too. And where we've actually spent a lot of time is over on the public side. Yeah. Um, you know, we have a very high, we're a, taxable entity with a very high muni bond allocation. Hmm. I mean, if you think about what a municipal bond is supposed to do from an impact perspective, it's very cool. Um, you, you know, usually you don't hear a lot about muni bonds, you know, at, at impact investing conferences. I feel like you're hearing more, but, you know, that's a huge market paying attention to, um, how our municipality, like, how, can we actually see what the impacts of those bonds are, are more, you know, are certain jurisdictions, can you favor certain jurisdictions that are chronically underinvested in areas with, you know, higher rates of poverty that need more sanitation or more infrastructure bonds, it, it, things like that, that you can filter through the portfolio that are liquid, you yeah. know, I mean, or mo de mo depending on your duration, relatively, but yeah. anyway, yeah, relatively speaking to venture. And so, you know, but they never get a, quite enough love, I feel like, in the impact space as well, but can offer a nice balance to the portfolio. No, and that's that's really helpful. Uh, one thing I was curious about, if you could speak to, one of the things I like about Blue Haven is it is, you, you've got the policy work, you've got the philanthropy, then you've got the, uh, the investment strategy, um, which I think is, which is really awesome. And I think I don't want to like skip over kind of that structure because what I love is the policy work you're doing. I have to believe, and this is what I love to speak to. I have to believe is informed by what you're seeing through your investment portfolio and, and what your fund managers are experiencing. And then also what your philanthropy is identifying as pain points in local communities. Can you talk to me about kind of that crossover work that you're seeing between all the different work things that you're into? De definitely. Um, so I'll start with a philanthropy example and very much i mean to, to your point we we sort of see ourselves as investors first and then the philanthropy we yeah we get inspiration from things that piss us off in our investment <laughs> portfolio and then I the love that. yeah <laughs> and then the philanthropy is like kind of the liquid yeah. like that kind of fills in so one example of that is um we uh, our, our venture portfolio, which is run by my, my colleague, Lauren Cochran, um, focuses on, um, on renewable energy access, fintech, and logistics companies in sub-Saharan Africa. Um, and uh, they're all kind of, they all have sort of a tech-enabled a tech sort of component. Um, and, you know, they are, they, they, they are, you know, VC-ready companies. Um, 
But one of the things we're seeing, and this is not just unique to um, investments on the continent, but you know, kind of generally speaking all over, um, is it's now, it's kind of up to the company to do a lot of the job upskilling mm. that you're gonna need. Um, yes, there are some external boot camps and things like that, um, but sometimes you're hiring someone and investing in them and you don't even know what their job is gonna be in five years because the space is moving really quickly. Um, teams are being decentralized and distributed and you might have a tech team over in Warsaw and then you've got a couple of developers in Cape Town, but then you're headquartered in Dakar. Like there's, there's, there's all kinds of different things that are moving around um, and different pieces of the puzzle. Um, but what we are also finding though, is that the function of HR finding a super visionary, strategically minded head of people who is saying, I'm going to dive in super early. I mean, they're usually startups, wait, 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 wait. And then they hire a head of people when they're like about to have a lawsuit. Um, oh, gosh. Do you know what I mean? Like, oh, yeah. so it's, it's never a function. Everyone's like, oh, as long as, you know, everybody's, everybody's um, salary is being paid and compliance functions are fine. But really people management and HR, the future of HR, um, we think is very much tied to future of work. It's going to be happening at the job level. Um, mm -hmm. And we think having strategically minded CHROs um, that understand this and can put in, you know, predictive analytics on productivity of their own workforces and really can help their CEOs understand from a people perspective what expansions looks like or sounds like yeah. um, is really important. Um, and we've seen our companies as they grow, where they hit a bottleneck is usually, it's a people issue, it's a hiring issue, it's a management issue. Um, and so what we started to do is work with a couple of consultants to put together like a 21st century, like absolutely world-class state of the art um, HR leadership course. So it's targeting heads of people at fast growing tech companies with total best in class thought around what incredible companies are doing internally, externally, what's your best tech, what's your, you know, what do you need to, to, to sort of think about and bring to your CEO um, to really get this on the board's agenda and things like that. So. So we're building this program out um, using our philanthropic dollars. Um, and it's, you know, not just for our own portfolio companies, of course, but for anyone else in the tech ecosystem. Um, and what's been really fun is as we've been, you know, building it out and starting to show some of the content to, um, you know, even like people that we want to even have guests speaking at it, they're like, wait, I want to. I want to take this course. Like, yeah. I don't know some of this stuff. Can be, <laughs> you know, <laughs> um, awesome. Yeah. So things like that around, um, you know, we, you know, the, a program like that might be able to cover its own costs. It's never going to make a ton of money and that's not the intention. It's, it's a training. It's really a training and a leadership course. Um, but we think it could be really influential and really, um, up the game of a lot of these super fast growing tech companies that people are starting to pay more attention to. Mm -hmm. um, so things like that. So that's like where our philanthropy then we're like, right. oh, okay, well, let's invest in this program with our philanthropic money. Yeah. Um, and it will hopefully just benefit everybody. Well, it's a win. Um, it's the win-win. It's the, you know, it, you're, you're helping, you've identified a problem in the ecosystem and you're using the appropriate capital to help solve for that across not just the companies you're working with directly, you've identified that problem, but it's now a service that can be accessible to any number of people. And now you've, you've elevated the workforce in a certain market while also then benefiting uh, the companies that you're, you're working through uh, on the investment side as well. Well, and, and that's, yeah. And it's really a, you know, it's, it's a, it's a, it's a future of work and a talent and a yep. human capital play. Um, you know, you read all these studies about future of work and it's usually about kind of education to employability, mm. but then who's setting the agenda once you're employed, 
who is doing that training on the job and how do they know, how do they make the business case to their CEOs for why this is important kind of going forward. So that's part of what we're, yeah, yeah interesting. part of what we're working on, which is kind of fun. And I love to, like, it's interesting. We were, we were talking recently with an organization, um, a utility actually, that is, you know, because of COVID rightfully uh, have a lot of customers that can't pay. And so affordability is something that they're struggling with on a day in and day out basis. And they're like, well, is that the right problem? You know, cause like they're thinking like the only levers I can pull are, uh, you know, cost, like the rate, the rates of the utility or infrastructure imp improvements that reduce the overall cost of consumption. So therefore making it more accessible. And so what I was trying to help them see is like, well, wait a minute, if, if the issue is they're not able to afford the bill, what does it look like for you to now advocate for a $15 minimum wage? You know, like right. when would you ever get involved in something like that? Because ultimately if they actually have a higher standard of living, they're now more likely to pay the utility because they want that. They need that. Um, and it's not, you know, they just can't afford it. And so, yeah. you know, I, I'm sure you run into that all the time where it's like, you know, thinking outside the box and coming to it from this integrated approach, this consciously constructed, like, this is what we want to see in the world. How can we best solve those problems? I've got to believe is, is a really, one, rewarding and fun, as you said, uh, but also like really hits the root of many of these community problems. Well, and I, I mean, I think that's, that's a big, that that's one of the reasons then that we focus a lot on kind of the civic work as well. So whether it's, you know, direct support for leaders that, that you know, we want to see an office because we think their policies will create a more equitable future for everyone, but, you know, supporting specific policies as well, like wealth tax. I mean, I can sit here all day long and talk about how much I love the investments in our portfolio. They will not touch inequality in this country the way a wealth tax would. Period. The end. I don't care how many amazing battery companies or diabetes. It's just not going to touch it the way yeah. a wealth tax an overarching federal wealth tax, um, you know, would um, yeah. you could you would cover list. That's the only way, you know, you could you could take those those assets and um, cover universal child care every year for everyone in the country. Like Isn't that, crazy? that moves the needle. Yeah, that okay. moves the needle, you know, and so that's where that's where we really kind of push for things like that and try to try to put our money where our mouth is in that sense yeah. on the civic side. And so, yeah, where markets can be helpful, we like that. But, sure. you know, to an investment portfolio. A, 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 our v, let me put it this way, our VC portfolio is not going to solve inequality in the United States. <laughs> yeah, period. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> exactly. Well, Lisa, we could talk all day and I'd love to, but I, <laughs> I appreciate your time. I wanted to kind of close on, uh, you know, because this season we're really focused on, you know, this, this notion of a consciously constructed and dynamic portfolio. Uh, you're gracious to give us time and talk about how you've been thinking about that with Blue Haven. Um, and we've, we've heard this kind of movement in the impact space for quite some time. Even last year at the Sorensen Impact Summit, they were talking about how it's going mainstream. Uh, but I wonder, you know, you as a pioneer and as a leader and a powerful voice in this in this community, what are you? What gives you hope um, as we kind of press towards that future? Uh, and then I think subsequently, what gives you pause? Like what concerns you? Because oftentimes when things go mainstream, so to speak, there are good things and then there are also bad things. And people jump on that bandwagon because they see dollar signs. Mm -hmm. So like, what what gives you hope and what gives you pause as we press forward? Well. I think I honestly, I think what gives me hope, um, is just a, um, and I think particularly in the last four years, there's been a bit of a comeuppance of what, um, what the private sector can do on its own versus when we, we really do need strong government institutions hmm. that work for us at the local level, at the state level, at the, at the, uh, uh, at the federal level, um, and at the global level, right? We need global infrastructure, multilateral organizations, things like that. 
um, are really important. I think, I guess, I guess when I started my impact investing journey, I feel like the pendulum had swung so far to like the private sector will win and mm -hmm. the private sector will do everything. Um, and then I'm starting, what gives me hope is that I'm starting to see it swing back. And I think a lot of that had to do with people saw, whoa, when we have a government <laughs> that is not, we took for granted sure. what the government actually does. Sure. Um, we thought it was all us doing all this fabulous stuff. And turns mm -hmm. out um, we actually do need um, a, a strong, like I think people started to appreciate that a little more. So sure. I think hopefully we can move into the next few years with a little humility around our public sector partners and how important um, we are to each other. So that actually gives me a whole lot of hope. Um, seeing, you know, things moving so fast on the climate front, you know, things like that, that gives me a whole lot of hope. And seeing um, the private sector kind of cheering it on. Yeah. So that gives me hope. Um, what gives me pause, I think, is sort of a similar thing that, um, you know, this, this, I've, has always kind of given me pause is that sometimes people are looking for the impact investing space to somehow be easier or more like less met, like they want a button to push, they want a database to sort through, they want to click here and invest there. Um, and like almost like trying to get out of actually doing the work. Mm -hmm. Um you know, everyone is like, oh, it's too, it's too hard. I don't know where the fund managers are. And it's like, yeah, that's your job is to like, yeah. to kind of, gotta do it, right? Like, it turns out there isn't just a list of things to buy that make you a billionaire. Yeah. Um, you know, like, we actually have to kind of like do the work um, and consider these things. And not everything is super straightforward. Um, we can see this with sort of the messiness in ESG data, different, you know, data service providers. Um, and so, and I think there is, there's a lot of nuance to this work. And what gives me pause is when I see investors coming in that kind of want to take the nuance out. Mm. Um, I don't mind friction. I think friction is good and it makes you more thoughtful. Um, so that's my, that's my only pause of, of just like, yeah, if it feels like you need to go back and consider something or you needed to have another conference, like that's okay. That's okay. That's yeah. part of the work. Like, yeah. yeah. And exactly. so that's my only thing of seeing new people coming in and it's like, they just want a list. Mm -hmm. They want a list um, and they want it to be the right list and it <laughs> needs to be perfect. It's just not, oh. you know what I mean? So that's, that's oh, yeah. the bit. That people want that silver bullet. And uh, yeah. So and, I, and yeah, so that's my only um, yeah, but that, I think that's, I don't think that's unique to this industry necessarily. <laughs> no, but it is, it's a good word. Cause I think, um, as things pick up steam and build momentum, uh, there are going to be people, be people that just jump in because like, oh, it's what everybody else is doing. The bandwagon folks, you know, there's the pioneers, the early adopters, the folks that really get it. Then there's the bandwagon folks that recognize, okay, I should probably do that. But then they jump in and they're, they're again, to your earliest point, we impact investing is about this moral obligation that we have to really understand who we are and what we care about and to align what we're doing with that. And so if that's the case, then there isn't a list. There isn't a list. You know, there is going to be that thoughtful engagement and interaction. So, well, and uh, yeah. And, and just to, just to sort of close out, I think one of the, you know, and this is, this is one thing I'm, and I recognize I'm in an extremely luxurious position being an inheritor of, of, a, of a rather large asset base. So I can sort of sit and ponder these questions, um, which not everybody can. Um, and I, I, I fully, I, I fully appreciate that, but like, you know, when given the choice and, and looking at different sorts of transactions, like, or what the implications of those transactions would be, um, is that how you want to make money? You know, yeah. is if, if you're a private equity fund and you're doing the stuff that everybody hates that private equity funds do, like, and you made a lot of, like, is that how you want to make your money? Like, that's the, I think that's, that's a big question, but that is also um, a very 
luxurious question to be able to ask oneself. So I recognize that. <laughs> yeah, no, no. I think the tension, I think, I think, you know, capturing that, like just recognizing there is a tension, uh, again, back to tension of the financial expectation and the impact. So 